Good morning, everyone. Can we go ahead and get uh, settled down? Today's speaker is Dr. Richard Cordo. He is from the Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology and an assistant professor of pediatrics at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. He is a Virginia native who trained at UVA, uh, went on to Washington University for his medical training, and joined the U.S. Air Force. Air Force and trained in San Antonio and served there for many years prior to joining Carilion in 2002. He's been an integral part in the growth and development of the GI department and takes a very active role in the teaching responsibilities. Please welcome Dr. Richard Cordell. So this uh, picture actually is taken from the Roanoke Times. Uh, this is Carillion, um, and these are window washers, we think. But as I studied this, I thought this was maybe picky rounds. So maybe that's uh, uh, Dr. Candy and so forth, maybe a resident. So I don't have anything to disclose. The reason I wanted to call this Game Changers is that there's been some seismic shifts in hepatitis, A, B, and C. And so um, the reason I put uh, uh, superheroes on the front page is because typically they, they're game changers for fighting crime, but we're talking about things that have changed dramatically with hepatitis. Now, I see a couple of faces in the room who might be able to raise their hand for this, but how many of you all have taken care of somebody who had H. flu meningitis? So, so when I became a resident, H. flu um, vaccine had come out a couple of years before that. That was a game changer in H. flu. It's almost, we don't see it anymore. You saw how many hands went up, not many. We just don't see it anymore. And some similar changes are happening in hepatitis. So that's what we're going to talk about. So, um, so you saw those grand rounds out there. So th the rumor is that this is why Dr. Burbridge is leaving, because they asked him to do this. And he said, this is where I draw the line. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do uh, today is talk about um, hepatitis A, B, and C. I'm going to just kind of overview each one to review some of the pathophysiology with each. And then each one is going to have a game changer. So each one, there's been some, some development some of these are old. I mean, this is sort of historically old, some of them. But the reason I, came, I wanted to talk about this is because since April, there's been a huge game changer in one of these. So let's go on. We're going to start in alphabetical order. And you might be thinking, well, hepatitis A, I never seen it. But um, it is pretty rare in uh, America. But just last year, last fall, if you frequented uh, tropical smoothie cafes in, um, around, you might have found yourself uh, another statistic. So uh, there was an outbreak of hepatitis A. You can see from this map that uh, Virginia was the epicenter of this outbreak. So there were um, 143 new cases, 129 of them were from Virginia. Fortunately, there's not a tropical smoothie cafe in Rona, no, but there is one in Blacksburg. Uh, the majority had uh, strawberry smoothies from, from uh, those in Virginia. It was traced to strawberry, strawberries packaged in Egypt. There were no deaths, fortunately, and the majority were in adults. There have been uh, similar outbreaks in the past. If you were a health nut and you like organic food, you might have suffered in 2013 if you picked up a package of pomegranates from Costco. There are 165 cases and no deaths. But a more serious outbreak in 2003 from salsa that, came, that was infected with green onions from Mexico. 601 cases, and there were three deaths on that. So let's uh, look at this graph. So prior to 1995, which is roughly here, there were multi-thousands of cases per year of hepatitis A. In 1995, a vaccine was developed, and you can start to see that, um, that the number started to drop off. Um, early in 1999, uh, the West Coast was targeted as a place where high-risk individuals were. These were mostly Native Americans, uh, um, people from uh, Alaska, and different people groups. And you'll see that in this slide, that uh, Hispanics and uh, uh, Native Americans took up the bulk of the population of those who have hepatitis A. And with a targeted immunization program, that also dropped the numbers down to these low numbers that we see today. 
And 2006, all children, it's been recommended that all children be immunized right. after the age of one. And really, uh, statistics say that about teenagers today, about 75 percent are immunized for that. So, um, so maybe it's relegated to the heap of our understanding, but there, this is still an important thing to consider. One percent of all international adoptees have active hepatitis A on arrival to the U.S. Uh, with the increased globalization, uh, many have to, many travel on business or mission trips and go back or adopt families um, uh, on adoption trips, and they come back, go to areas that are endemic with hepatitis A. And so outbreaks still occur. We, as you saw, we import our food from areas where um, hepatitis A is endemic. So what about hepatitis A? It's highly infectious. It's hard to kill, either with drying, heating, cold, and it's only inactivated at high temperatures. 185 degrees Fahrenheit is turning your steak into a hockey puck. So it's very um, hot. Usually you um, cook your, if you're a grill person, you grill it up to about 170. So humans are the primary host. The virus um, will home to the liver, and then uh, it'll be shed in the bile. Okay, so that it'll come out in the stool. Hence, hepatitis A is a fecal oral transmission uh, rather than the other two, which are bloodborne. So in areas where hygiene is limited or the water supply is compromised, you'll see uh, those areas being um, highly endemic. <clears throat> Am I going backwards? Okay. So uh, thus you'll see it worse in, in areas with poor sanitation. Um, and, uh, and crowding. So if you look at this, gra this uh, uh, map, you'll, you'll see three colors. There are three levels of uh, endemicity or incidence. You'll see these dark green areas that are high, uh, high incidence. You'll see this light green, which is medium, and then this white area, which is low. I don't know what the deal is with green one. Um, but anyway, so the, um, I mean, how many people are there? To Anyway, so, um, so back to the point. So this is an important clinical point. What, what, what develops then is three groups. If you live in an area that's hi, uh, highly endemic, you're typically going to get infected as a child. The illness as a child is mild. It's usually like a gastroenteritis. We might see, you know, if we were in there, we might bypass a patient like, like that. I worked in Honduras two summers ago and saw, you know, about 80 patients a day. Most of them all had diarrhea. Perhaps some of them had hepatitis A because their water supply is poor. Fortunately, I was immunized. Um, but, th but so typically, you're not going to see outbreaks of serious liver disease because they're going to be getting it early in life. However, in those light, gray, light green areas, um, those areas are, are, have a medium or intermediate endemicity. So those people might live until they're uh, teenagers or young adults without ever being infected. And then there might be an outbreak in their area. They're going to have a much more serious case. Or you might see babies that will get infected, and those who might have fulminant hepatitis, which means going to full liver failure within about eight weeks. And so in some of those countries, 80% of fulminant hepatitis is going to be from hepatitis A. So some serious um, uh, outbreaks. You also see some more chronic uh, forms of hepatitis A in those countries. And low endemic areas like the U.S., we have a large population of people who don't have hepatitis A. And so we're all susceptible unless we've been immunized. So if you were not immunized and you ate at the Tropical Smoothie Cafe, you would be uh, susceptible to infection. Fortunately, most people don't have a, a problem with that. So what are some of the risk factors for hepatitis A? And what you can see from this graph is, or this pie chart, and so there's a large portion where we're not really certain where the virus, the virus came from. Sexual contact accounts for about 24%. And then you'll see uh, food and water outbreaks. Daycare um, is an important source. Not as much so lately, but uh, was in the past. You would see outbreaks in daycares. And the reason for that will become obvious in a minute. So this is one of those uh, board looking, uh, boards looking graphs. Uh, and this just shows you the course, the natural history of hepatitis A over time. What I want to bring your attention to is over here is the uh, inoculation. And then shortly, two to four weeks uh, incubation, you start to see evidence of hepatitis A in the stool 
and viremia. This is the, ahead of symptoms. So this is uh, uh, when the viruses are gonna start to have an outbreak. You start to pass it on. So you can imagine a daycare worker who doesn't know that they're sick could pass it on, or a child that is sick and going through maybe a, what looks to be a, 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 just a diarrheal illness infects that susceptible adult. That person then, before they even know, can start to pass it on to other people. So that's how an outbreak develops. The manifestations are nausea, vomiting, maybe diarrhea in a young child, or jaundice. And you can see as you age that the severity of the illness in terms of its liver involvement increases. So back to this, um, uh, 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 there might be some, uh, most of the time it's self-resolved, but there might be some more chronic um, uh, hepatitis A syndromes. And so, uh, you can see cholestatic jaundice that will last for six to 12 months in some people. And you see this typically in those intermediate countries where there's intermediate intimacy. Uh, I've never seen a case of that. You can also see a relapsing type, which for nine to 12 months will have mild uh, worsenings in their hepatitis. The fulminant I've mentioned, and then some autoimmune type um, responses. So um, obviously prevention is gonna be best by uh, sanitation, but also I wanna mention and talk about passive immunization and active immunization, immunization and what that might mean. So passive immunization in the past was uh, really a forefront of our management of patients who were recently exposed or were going to go to another country um, or were in a category that we couldn't immunize. And so its role has dwindled as we've learned that active immunization is actually superior and that one, do, one uh, shot of vaccine usually protects most people um, within 18 days of the immunization. Um, patients under one or over 40, however, are a little bit more susceptible. So those patients should get, if they're gonna be exposed or were exposed, should get a passive shot of immunoglobulin. Secondly, um, if you just had an exposure, within uh, two weeks you should get a shot. Or if you're getting ready to go to a country and you haven't had time to get your vaccine, you should get your vaccine, but also take a shot of um, immunoglobulin if you're really concerned, if you really think you're gonna be working in an area where you're, you're, the water supply is gonna be compromised and you can't filter it or you can't be controlled. However, you should know that one dose, as soon as you know that you're gonna get ready to go to another country, get your shot, go, go do it then. So if you only have a month, Go ahead and get your shot of hepatitis. Is that clear? Did I say that clear? Okay. So, um, and this is what I was saying. It's two-dose cycle, uh, zero and six months roughly, but the second dose, um, you can wait three to six months or longer and still have the same booster response. And uh, fortunately, uh, long-term immunity is, is greater than 20 years. So, immunization is our game changer. So, what you see here, and, and this was obvious earlier, this is an old game changer is that with immunization, we've been able to reduce the incidence of hepatitis A. So it is sort of relegated to the ash heap of our, of our experience, and we don't see cases just like we were talking about with H flu. All right, so hepatitis B is a larger scope. So um, a good fifth of the 5% uh, of the population um, are uh, estimated to be infected with hepatitis B, less so in the United States. Last, in 2015, which is the latest records that we have from the CDC, uh, there were 3,370 3, cases, which is actually a 20% increase. But if you look at the graph, and I'll show you in a second, that's not a really a seismic increase in, 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 act, in activity. About, uh, estimates are um, maybe uh, just under a million to two million cases of pa patients in, in America with that. Half of those are gonna be Asian or Pacific Islanders. So here's another one of those graphs. Um, this is a three levels of endemicity, so less than 2% of the population, 2 to 7% or greater than 8. So what you'll see here is Sub-Saharan uh, Africa um, and Asia are high endemic areas. And interestingly, Inuit populations in northern Canada and Alaska. So think about that. So this is the um, hepatitis B virus. Now, A is RNA virus. This is the DNA virus. Uh, and as you can see here, it's, it's double-strandedness is not um, uh, complete here. And so it requires the host cell to, to sort of complement its 
uh, deficiency. And so it relies heavily on the, it, it integrates into the host DNA. Hence, it can kind of stay under the radar for a long time. So you've seen all these, let's just to review this, hepatitis surface antigen is this outer uh, envelope protein. And evidence of this indicates infection. So whenever you test for that and you find it, that's an indicative of infection. And antibody to it is often indicative of clearance. However, there are people who are hepatitis, who've had an infection, are anti-HBS positive and may still have some DNA present because of this uh, covert action of the hepatitis B. The core is this nucleocapsid uh, protein that's here, and then um, and uh, early on in the uh, after infection, IgM elevation and hepatitis B core will evidence of, of an infection. Uh, just underneath of that is the E antigen, which is released when there is active replication. So if you measure E antigen and it's positive, that means there's active infection. This person is more infectious. There are more um, uh, at risk for some of the complications of hepatitis B. And of course, this is the DNA. So this is rare, while A was transmitted by um, fecal oral, this is by blood products. And so you're going to see this uh, in the past. We would see it more with transfusions. But now uh, IV drug use, uh, immigrants from uh, endemic areas, and vertical transmission. And that really is the, the, the most, um, that's how the, the virus today is uh, keeping itself alive. Here's our, our dreaded natural history um, graph. So what you should note from this is that this is an acute um, infection. So what I want you to learn from hepatitis B is that if you get hepatitis B early in life, not so good. If you get it later in life, say as a teenager or older, you're probably going to kick it. But when you get it as a baby, you're not, the chances are high that you're not going to get rid of it. About 25% as a child will, get on, will have chronic infection, but as you get older, that drops off. So let's just say you get a blood stick, and unfortunately, it was from a patient with hepatitis B. It was a person from China who has it. You got stuck, and you have it now. What's going to happen to you? So within about a two months, uh, that's six to eight weeks, you're going to get hepatitis B surface antigen evident, okay? But your symptoms are going to come a few weeks later by ALT elevation, and then you become jaundice. You're going to have malaise. You're going to feel sick as a dog and um, probably be out of work for a little bit, okay? And then after a few more weeks, then we're going to see that there's active replication happening, um, and then your symptoms are going to hang on for months. Okay, then we're going to, we're, early on we can see the core being positive, and that will turn off, and then later this will become total uh, core positive. Eventually, you'll start to develop antibody to the surface um, uh, antigen. Meanwhile, you'll also have seroconverted, your E antigen, so you're negative there. Active replication is less. This doesn't in integrate into your host DNA, and you kick this thing, okay, and it's gone and you recover, and you're now immune. Okay, so this is about a six-month ordeal, six to eight months. But the chronic is a little bit different, and this is complicated, and I want to go over this with you, and um, hopefully this isn't um, uh, too busy. So this is for a person who um, uh, gets this as a baby. So you get it as a baby, and then you sort of coexist, not like the license plate bumper sticker, but you coexist with the, um, with the virus for a while. And um, so we call this the immune tolerant phase. And I learned, um, I figured out how to do this, I think, with these little uh, buttons. So 80 to 90% of, of infants who are exposed to the virus uh, will be infected. It's a high transmission rate. And you'll see in hepatitis C that's much less. Before age two to three, very slow chance that you might have a seroconversion. It means you go from HBSE antigen positive to negative. And as you age, that's going to speed up a little bit. So as a child ages, they actually might turn and become E antigen negative. So that means less active replication of the virus. But it doesn't mean you're not infected. You're still infected. It just means it's gone under the radar. Okay, so um, your liver enzymes are normal. Lots of DNA, greater than 20,000. Uh, and I, I list these two different copy measurements, because depending on the lab, they might measure it different ways. It's a five-fold factor difference. So your E antigen positive, S antigen positive, 
And this is, if you were to try to treat somebody like this, they're not going to respond to therapy typically. So you just watch these patients. And this is, by and large, the children. You're going to watch them, and this is going to last for 10 to 20 years. But you don't just leave them alone. You check their labs every 6 to 12 months, because there could be a change. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a sec. Oops. All right. Mess completely up. All right, so we're going to go to, let me just show you how I know how to do these buttons. Bam. And then, so then, um, so, so then you have, after the immune tolerant phase, then you go to the, um, then there could be this immune active phase. And what this means is that your, your immune system starts to catch up to the virus, and you start to seroconvert. So there's lots of inflammation now going to develop in the liver. You're going to see the ALT rise, and you're still E antigen positive, okay? Now, if... Oh, hold on. Let me try that again. Bam. Bam. So your liver enzymes are going to be elevated. Let me mention this for a second. Um, so in our lab, our lab, the ALT is 60 and under is normal. But if you go internationally, it's 30 and under. So if this says 1.5 to 2 times greater than upper limit and normal, it's pretty much abnormal in our lab. So if you do 60, uh, if you're over abnormal, then you're, then you're showing evidence of inflammation. So... You still have lots of DNA present. Your E antigen, S antigen positive. At this stage, you are susceptible, or you're actually a better candidate for treatment. Okay, but if you see a patient where you're starting to see they meet all this criteria, and it's the first time you've seen them, so you're going to wait three to six months because they could be in the time where they're seroconverting, and so they could be changing. You want to watch and see if they're going to seroconvert. But if they don't, then then they might be amenable to treatment. All right, watch this. Bam. All right. So this is also what happens if you get infected later, like the one I just showed you with acute infection. You'll go over to this active phase, and then you clear it. All right, so what happens next? Then you're going to go and you're going to seroconvert, which means you become anti-HBE negative, and you become an inactive carrier, okay? So um, you're still HBSAG positive, you're still infectious, and you're still at risk for hepatocellular carcinoma and cirrhosis, but much, much less. Okay? And because the, if the ALT is normal in this phase, you don't treat. That's the key. ALT normal, don't treat. However, there are a group of people who are immune react, inactive who will go on and have a reactivation. About a fifth could, could do this. So sometime while they're inactive, so the temptation is just to leave those patients alone and never see them again, but they could have a reactivation at some point. And you can also see this with immune suppression. So like a person gets Crohn's or has a transplant or goes, has cancer, you could see a, a reactivation of their hepatitis B. And so some have recommended, actually, that we test patients who are getting ready to do it and make sure that they're not having uh, an, ina they're not an inactive carrier. Okay, so your DNA is going to go back up again. You're going to be E antigen, maybe you might be E antigen negative in this case but your SA engine is positive, okay? And then a very, very low uh, rate might go on and develop, after you've, after you've seroconverted, some of these inactive carriers might go on and develop anti-HBS positive, but that's rare, it's really rare. So most of these people are going to go on under the radar screen with these inactive carriers. They're still at risk for hepatocyte or carcinoma. All right, sorry. So um, I forgot to hit all my buttons. Let's do this. Bam. Bam. All right. So this is another way of showing this uh, over time. And this just shows this immune tolerant phase, high um, uh, DNA, your E antigen positive. Then you could have these fluctuations of DNA and your ALT where they go up and down opposite of each other. And then you seroconvert and you become an inactive carrier much later in life. And you can have a reactivation. So that's sort of the timeline. Uh, uh, with it. Now, there could be some complications. There's three complications. One is fulminant hepatitis. Usually, if you're going to have fulminant from, a, uh, from hepatitis B, it's going to be as a baby. Usually, these are from E antigen negative mothers. There's a pre core, and I don't want to get to the genetics, but there's a pre core uh, mutation in these people, and so they can have uh, a, a rapid onset to liver failure uh, within weeks, usually uh, at, within months of life. And there's a high mortality unless you get these people to a transplant center. So that's, it's serious. We don't see that much, 
because the you know the, the rate here in America is about 0.2 percent, but um, but it still is out there. Cirrhosis is a complication. This is for these adults who have had it for uh, many many years, although it has been reported in childhood. Um, usually, about a quarter of those who have been infected will go on to have cirrhosis, and then a big concern is hepatic cell carcinoma. The risk every decade goes up about five percent, and so as as the longer that you are A antigen positive, um, it correlates to your risk of, infect, of developing carcinoma or cirrhosis. That's why we want to treat those people. So what about treatment? I went back. So we'll talk about that. First, you're going to talk to your patient, and you're going to tell them um, you can go and do, have a normal life. You can play the sports. Um, you can um, you know, uh, get married. You can do those things. Uh, but everybody else in the family should probably be vaccinated. Um, this is an important factor when you're going to bring somebody in from China or an in endemic area. Um, everybody in the family should be immunized before that person gets, gets into America. Cross immunity, uh, also immunized with HIV because a super infection with hepatitis A is much more severe than a person who also has B. Then you're going to monitor them. Because remember, monitoring them will help you to see if they're going to, uh, with their courses with time. So about six to 12 months, you're going to be monitoring them. And this is, uh, just to speak to that, this is a complicated slide, I think. So um, as you're monitoring with time, you'll see them slowly increase their ALT. So as they increase their ALT, you'll see their years towards seroconversion decrease. So you'll start to see a bump in their ALT. Then you want to start watching that patient a little more carefully and see what's going on with their um, their infection, because they might seroconvert. So you're going to be checking E antigen, and you're going to be checking to make sure that didn't change. And then you're going to be watching to see if you're going to start treatment on that person. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what checking. All right. So as you talk about treatment, you want to think a little bit about this very complicated replication. This is the simplest slide I could find toward this. Remember, the DNA is incomplete, comes into the uh, cell, uh, integrates into the, uh, and becomes complete, and then it starts uh, pumping out these intact virions, and the DNA actually works backwards. So it becomes RNA, then has a reverse transcriptase to make it go backward. And this is where a lot of uh, new medications, nucleoside analogs, have targeted this, this step in the process. But you can target entry into the cell, um, or you can target interferon. You can activate um, and make these cells more susceptible to destruction. So, um, so we have interferon, and then we have all these new, they're not so new now, but they're nucleoside analogs. So what are the goals of treatment? Goal is to try to get them to surface antigen negative, but that almost is never achieved, the treatment. So we're not really fully curing, and I'll, I'll have another slide that mentions this. So really, we're going to settle for a lower goal, which is E antigen seroconversion and a reduction in hepatitis B. So let's look first at interferon alpha. So this is three shots a week. Six million units per meter squared body, and and and, um, and and this works somewhat. So um, the advantage is it's finite treatment, and those nucleoside analogs you keep treating. You just keep treating until uh, at least for a year after they seroconvert. That's a long time of treatment, sometimes forever. And if, if you know anybody that's ever had interferon, they feel terrible. And we're going to talk more about this when we talk about hepatitis C. Um, so they get flu-like symptoms, changes in their personality, uh, bone marrow suppression, weight loss, growth suppression. I'm going to talk more about that uh, later when we go to. But what, how, how well does it work? So look at this. A quarter of patients in, in two, two large studies um, seroconverted. So a quarter. So now you've treated this person for six months, three shots a week, and maybe you've seroconverted uh, a quarter of them, and they're still infected. They're not cured. They're just less likely to have cirrhosis, less likely to have a complication. Um, and that happened, 11% seroconverted on their own. So a uh, game changer? No. Uh, so long-term, um, uh, what am I saying here? So in long-term, seroconversion equaled controls. Uh, so after a time, the controls kept, um, made pace with the, those who are treated. Anyway, there's some genotypes in uh, hepatitis B that are not as clinically significant as they are with C, and so I'm not going to dwell on that. So there's new pegylated interferon, which means you can only do a shot a week. 
has not been as well tested in B as it has been in C, uh, and, and people are looking into that because it is a finite treatment, and that's its advantage, because it only is six months as opposed to these other oral treatments which go on forever. And this is what I was trying to get to is that we decrease the risk, but no, there's no cure. Here's my risk of carcinoma and cirrhosis over here. And as I go from E antigen positive to seroconvert, I've lessened my risk, but I haven't gone to cure. As my, my DNA decreases, I've lessened the risk, but I've become an inactive carrier. I've not cured, though. I'm still infectious. I still have a risk for these things. It's just less. If I become S antigen negative, I have a normal liver biopsy, probably almost negligible risk. But I've still got um, covalently closed, I think that's what that says, DNA, still present, and I'm, I, I have a functional cure. But our goal is this total absence, and this is never achieved, really, with the treatment. So let's look at some of these nucleoside an, uh, analogs. And these, like I said, don't achieve the, the, the nirvana of uh, full, full cure. The first one that came out was lamivudine, which is pretty much uh, out in the, uh, the trash heap of treatment. Its advantages was that it was a pill, had no side effects, but the treatment was indefinite. As I mentioned, it took years to get a person to seroconvert, and often they did not. You just kept the virus at bay. But, look, but after about a year, 19% were resistant. They developed these YMDD mutants. And over time, they actually started to become more seriously infected. Those mutants started to develop a, a life of their own. And after three years, if you kept that suppression on the, the uh, regular virus, these mutants developed. And they, they went on to um, make the person have more complications from hepatitis B. So a new one came out, adefavir, and this was targeted for, for adults, but it was approved for children over 12 who perhaps had failed from lamivudine. You added this to it, and then you might get some, um, the, you, had, um, you might get some more success with that. There's still problems with resistance, and there really hasn't been a huge role, so adefavir is out. So tenofovir um, is, is helpful because there's no development of resistance, useful for, uh, only for patients greater than 12, um, however, look at this, minimal seroconversion of um, E antigen in the study period. So the patients are better, but they're not really cured from this. Atecavir is uh, really for, the, for children, was approved in 2014 to be used in all children, 2 to, two to 17, not under 2. And this is for people who didn't see other treatments. So that's what tenofovir is useful for, is for people who were, in, were treated with other things. So treatment naive, uh, you're going to get entecavir. They had a favorable drop in their DNA, but again, 20% compared to 3% seroconverted. Remember, seroconversion ain't a cure. Okay, so treatment is not the game changer. What is the game changer? So prevention might be the best method, and a vaccine became available in the 80s, and then universal vaccine uh, vaccinations in countries developed in the early 90s. Countries like U.S. started in 91, and then um, uh, the, the uh, Asian countries followed suit uh, thereafter and have made a huge impact in this. So this is just a review of what you're supposed to do. Um, so if you're, this is uh, for um, our, our program in America, we screen mothers for hepatitis B. If you're positive, you'll get your first dose of vaccine and you'll get uh, immune globulin. Okay, so HB immune globulin within 12 hours of birth. And this uh, successfully reduces infection. Remember, it was 80 to 90 percent down to 10 to 15 percent. So still people can sneak through, especially if the mother has a very high viral load, then the chances of, um, of transmission are much higher. So um, if it's unknown, you don't know the mother's status, then you're going to go ahead and give a vaccine within 12 hours. So the key here with the unknown is 12 hours. You're not going to give HBIG. And then um, if you're negative, you're still going to give a vaccine, but you just don't have to do it immediately. You're going to do it before they leave the hospital. Okay, so what's the effect of this? So first the vaccine came out in the early 80s. And you start to see this, uh, the incidence tumble. This is in the U.S. And then you see universal vaccine in the early 90s, and this is our game changer. Okay, so big impact. Again, not a, a recent thing. The reason I really started this talk was for the hepatitis C, and that's what we're going to talk about next, because that's um, what the difference is. But look at this graph. What's different about this that you notice? This is the incidence of hepatitis C over time. So our other graphs, we notice the tail really low down here in terms of incidence. But here, you see an increase, 2.6-fold increase over the last uh, five years. 
This is uh, not gender prevalent. Uh, this is both populations. And start to cogitate on that. Think about females getting infected, childbearing age. This is the age. So most of these are people, uh, millennials, um, so to speak. So this is 20 to 40 year olds, and um, but who are getting infected, and really this is because of IV drug use. This also this graph shows you that um, we're, that in, uh, in Alaska, remember that graph showed Inuits in a high high endemic, and also in Alaska we're seeing a huge. Uh, we're not making gains there, but also white non-Hispanic we're also seeing an increase. So um, in Appalachia. In the U.S. and the mainland, the uh, CONUS, so to speak, the continental U.S., the um, Appalachia is really leading the forefront for incidents, which is not something to be proud of. So if you think about that graph with the, um, with the young people getting affected and that it's equal male-female, that would make you start to think there's going to be some mothers, more mothers, if you really think about that. Let's see if the data shows that. So this, this graph shows you that these um, states in, in gray have a huge increase in mothers who are infected. If you look at uh, West Virginia is leading the way. So 22 uh, um, of every 1,000 births, mothers positive. That is huge. And it, so 5% transmission rate to infants. I looked up, there were 20,700 births last year in West Virginia. So uh, doing the math, that's about, a, is that a, I think it's 20 babies, right? There's 20 babies. Um, uh, I think I, I, did, I had the math right in my mind. Because if it's 5% of 22 a year, that would be one baby for every 1,000 times 20. Yeah. So about 20 babies in West Virginia last year were infected with hepatitis C. That doesn't seem like a lot. But when you think about all these other uh, infections, um, that is significant in my mind. So the national estimate is that there's about um, you know, 30 to 40,000 uh, children in America with hepatitis C. Risk factors typically are the ones we see with hepatitis B, so uh, sexual contact, but that's not really an efficient way of transmitting. About 5% uh, if you have a contact with a, a partner who has hepatitis C, the chances of transmission are about 5% with that. IV drug use is really leading the way in our hepatitis C problem in America. With the problem with opioid usage, there's a lot of transition over to heroin usage, and that's why we're seeing this huge increase, I think, in this. And there's also huge drug use in Alaska, and that's why that's also leading the way based on those slides. Transfusion, I list here only for historical purposes. Um, after eight, uh, 1992, there was a, an ELISA that developed for hepatitis C, so we were able to screen blood products. But prior to that, you had thalassemia, or if you were on dialysis, um, the risk of getting hepatitis C was huge. Um, this is a clinical course, which is a little bit different from hepatitis B. So the differences are, um, is the length of time. It's just everything is sort of frame shifted into months rather than, uh, uh, or to years and months rather than weeks and months. So after infection, about two weeks, you're going to have evidence of RNA in your system. But after about four to ten weeks, before you start to uh, become antibody positive. And then you're going to start to see your um, ALT. What do you notice here? It goes up and down. You can be normal ALT and still be infected. Just like with hepatitis B, you can have a normal ALT. And, and so you can't rely on that and say, oh, you're fine. Before. You could still be um, positive. Um, and so you can see the uh, uh, anti-HCV becomes positive. This does not indicate. Uh, that you've cleared it just means that you've been exposed. It doesn't mean that you've cleared it. And you can be positive even though you've been through treatment. Symptoms early on are mild, almost none. Most are asymptomatic and go on through life never knowing it. So all those baby boomers who are at Woodstock are now, went, uh, you know, 40 years without knowing that they were infected and now are um, having to deal with, with that. All right, so the genome. So, you know, remember the Omnidroid from an Incredibles, you couldn't it would learn what your weaknesses are and it would change. You know, the, the genome is kind of similar to that. So this is a little bit easier for me to handle. It's one straight line, one open reading frame. There are these structural proteins down here. This is the core in the envelope. Then these non-structural proteins here, which are mostly proteases. Okay, so 
In this area here in the um, E1, E2 are these hypervariable regions, the RNA polymerase for hepatitis C. So the polymerase, remember, is that's what's, that's what's going to drive your new, your duplicate, duplicated um, uh, 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 RNA. You're going to spin that off. Is has low fidelity, so it's going to be inserting mutations into that um, every time it makes a new, new transcript. So this is where the, um, uh, let me use my, this is where the immune system is going to put its pressure. So as you develop antibodies to HCV, you're putting pressure on the E1, E2. A mutation comes along, then you have these quasi-species within each individual that go on to live. And then they become, they, be, they become the one that stays alive while you kill off the one that, that you recognize. And so this mutation, this ra rapid mutation, keeps hepatitis C going on, and that's why it stays chronic. It's the omnidroid of viruses. So there are these genotypes also. So there were quasi-species, but there are these genotypes within hepatitis C. And this has been more important with this because it will tell what kind of um, medication we might use and how we approach or what we see. And so demographically, genotype 1 is uh, responsible for the majority that we see in America. It's also very difficult to treat. So in the past, when we've used interferon and ribavirin, which is what we had for children, um, genotype 1 really responded poorly to that. Genotype 2 and 3, much better, um, but were mostly in other countries. 4, you might see in the Middle East, and then 5 and 6, we've almost never seen. So again, what type you are tells what kind of course you're going to have, the genotypic phenotypic um, correlation. As I mentioned, most are asymptomatic. It's rare, but some do develop cirrhosis as children. Um, two children have been reported with carcinoma related to hepatitis C. So very rare. You're going to see a problem. The majority of children are going to sneak through um, their 20, you know, 20 years that we're going to take care of them, and we're not going to see any complications. The problem is later in life. Hepatitis C is, um, and so biopsy show that this, but underneath the radar, they're developing uh, fibrosis. They're going on to develop cirrhosis in, in life. There's been some cognitive delays that have been reported and maybe some other milder symptoms. So what happens as an adult? So HCV remains the greatest uh, indicator for transplant today. And you don't want to be transplanted if you have hepatitis C because you don't do as well. So the majority, you know, transplant for livers highly successful. Their first year survival is in the high 90s, five-year survival, much, not much lower than that. But look at the, look at the uh, statistics for those who have hepatitis C. 71% survival at five years. That's the patient graph, and this means you have to be re retransplanted in half of five years. So it'd be great to give a vaccine as a child. You don't have any symptoms. You could give a vaccine as a child, and then you would block all these terrible adulthood things where you have to go through cirrhosis and then you have to go through treatment forever. And so, but one doesn't exist. And we've never been able to develop a vaccine, so now treatment is what we require. So what kind of treatment do we have? And before I start talking about treatment, I've got to teach you the jargon of treatment. So this is a graph that shows that. So this is weeks after starting therapy. So where's my pointer? There you are. So um, this is before treatment. This is your RNA load. And so rap, if you have uh, a rapid response, which means you go down to undetectable within four weeks, that's what RVR is. This is what most do who have a successful treatment. After about 12 weeks, they come down to this early viral response. Then you're gonna, they stay under the, uh, they stay negative throughout this time. You finish, you have an end of treatment response, but a significant portion of people relapse after the, that medication is removed. So with interferon, you treat with genotype 1, you're going to treat for 48 weeks, finish your treatment, and then a significant portion would then relapse. So you've gone through a year of treatment with shots, and then you're going to relapse. However, if you've stayed negative for 24 more weeks, we consider that a sustained viral response, and that accounts for that. It's rare that you're going to relapse after that. So let's look at interferon. So Interferon used to be a three times a week injection, just like it was for hepatitis B. Now it's pegylated, which means you can do it once a week. And then um, alone, you can get a 21% SVR. So that's dreadful. But with adding ribavirin, you can bring it up to 50%. And in adults, it's even much less than that. 
for genotype 1, which remember is the majority of Americans. 2 and 3 fare much better. Younger is better than older. So if you get treated as a grammar school child, you do much better, about 50% compared to 26%. This is with interferon and ribavirin. Okay, so, so it seems like it would be better to treat these people early in life. So this seems reasonably effective, right? Let's go ahead and treat people. So, however, it's long, it's 48 weeks, and it's difficult. So uh, with genotype 1 and 4, which is the majority of people we see, 48 weeks, and then you have all these side effects. A good 17% develop um, Hashimoto's, develop hypothyroidism. A third have marrow suppression with neutropenia and thrombocytopenia requiring dose reduction. Um, every time you get a shot, you feel like death. You have, uh, you have fever, anorexia, nausea. Um, you, uh, because of the ribavirin, you can develop a hemolytic uh, anemia. So you're checking labs in these people once a month. Um, you can have weight loss and growth suppression almost in the majority. And then they just feel like they just want to die. So depression, irritability, and suicide is a big portion. A lot of people, you should screen them before you get put on interferon because there's a chance they might <coughs> cough a bridge. And I'm, I, I, I don't just mean to say that flippantly. I mean, it's, it's serious. So um, this is a patient I wanted to kind of highlight of mine. So um, <coughs> this patient is a, um, he's now, uh, I think he's 20 right now. He has, uh, but when I saw him, he was about eight or nine. He has trisomy 21, and he has genotype four because there, he's from Egypt. And, um, and I saw him, and I offered the family, because he was young and because uh, I knew about these complications later in life, I thought, let's give him a treatment. And because the parents could, could force the treatment on him, I, you know, because they could get the treatment in better when he was smaller. And so I said, let's go ahead and go for it. Look at this. He, this is with treatment. He shot up his ALT. And so, uh, and he had other complications I'm going to show you in a minute. So I, we stopped treatment sh very shortly after that. And then later in life, the family was saying, what are we going to do? And there was nothing new on the horizon. He was about 13 or 14, um, and I treated him again. And with this, we had a better response. I dropped his uh, ALT back to normal and, uh, and went on. So, but look at his hemoglobin. This is with the second treatment. So we had better, remember, this was the one with better response. His hemoglobin dropped to six. Uh, with treatment. This is his uh, white count. This is with the first treatment. Uh, this is five here, 5,000. And you can see that he dropped way down. I didn't give him any kind of, uh, 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 you know, growth factor or anything to give him um, uh, a stimulus for that. What do you call that? Luke, uh, lutein. I didn't give him anything like that. But anyway, he recovered after I stopped, stopped treatment. But look at this, his weight. So this is with the first treatment, he dropped some weight. And this is second treatment, significant weight loss. And I should mention that with this second treatment, with both treatments, he felt terrible. And this is a, a happy boy who come in, he, was, he was, had speech delay. But he, the parents would tell me he would hide behind the couch. They couldn't get him to eat. They couldn't get him out in public. He would hide under park benches when they got him out. He was just not the same boy. They were very upset with the treatment. So I stopped it again, and he came back. And started, and you can see he gained weight up a lot, I believe, after that. So this is interferon. This is interferon treatment that brings 20% um, success. So not a game changer. So in the last five to 10 years, there's been some direct-acting antivirals. And they're targeting these guys on this end. These are those proteases. So this is back to molecular biology. So you make a, a protein. The way this works in this particular virus is it makes a protein intact. All these things are connected, and then these proteases come out and start chopping it up. And it's a post-translational modification, chop this thing up. So two acting drugs came out early, bezeprevir and telaprevir. And to take bezeprevir, you would take four pills three times a day. It did improve your SVR if you took it with vibrovirin, but you had to take 20 grams of fat every time you um, had it. So here's 20 grams of fat, um, five uh, pieces of, uh, this is, or four eggs, so every meal in order to get adequate uh, absorption. And then telaprevir was, uh, was confounded by Stevens Johnson's and a bad rash. And so these guys are all gone, they're off the market. And the reason for that is because better guys came along. So new and improved. So now it's become uh, word salad. So, sovaspuvir and ribavirin 
uh, came out and together achieved, look at this, SVR 95%. Okay, this is after 12 weeks of treatment. More agents followed. The most recent, you might have seen ads for this one, the Savasavivir and Letaplast here, so say that quickly, is Harvoni. That's why I put the names down. I'm not, I don't have any kind of collusion with them. It's just I'm putting the names down so we can talk. Um, but look at the SVR in these guys. One pill a day, side effects are a mild fatigue, headache, nausea. Compare that to interferon. Best for genotypes one and four. So Harvoni came out, this is for adults, and just, it just immediately changed the um, frontier for hepatitis C. This is after 30 years of, of not being able to do anything. All right, so here's the word salad. Look at all these agents now that are out. They're all in combinations. So look at this guy. Um, um, uh, Ombitasvir, per paratipavir, vartanavir, plus dasabuvir, plus ribavirin. Um, that's one. Uh, so, <laughs> but this is uh, the ones that, uh, so fortunately the FDA recently in April decided that they had two trials going on with children saw so much success in adolescents that now it's approved for children greater than 12, and that's the impetus for this lecture. So again, remember, SBR is in 90 to 100 percent, so this is a huge change. And so it was FDA approved, but only three have been approved for children, and this sort of, in my mind, makes it easier. So the ones that are approved, and this is for children older than 12, and again, remember, genotypes make a difference. So for genotype 1, we're going to give them so Fosbuvir, Letoposphere, this is Harvone, okay? You can do it for 12 weeks, one pill a day. Mild nausea, fatigue, and headache. If you have two and three, you can use So Fosbuvir and Ribavirin, or you can use So Fosbuvir and Velpotosphere. This is Efclusa, is the name of that one, okay? So this is our game changer. So there's another other shoe, though. Look at this. For Havoni, a 12-week course costs you $95,000. That means roughly $1,125 a fill. So if you drop one down the sink, um, which I've done, with not with, I don't take Harvoni, but with other things. Um, here's Zepatir, which is uh, a, a, a cost savings of $40,000. You can take this. This is for, Zepatir is really for, um, is for one in four. Genotypes one and four, you could take that for 12 weeks. So its, um, it's advantage is that it's um, less, uh, less expensive. And this is uh, Zepatir, no, I'm sorry, Epclusa. That was up here. Epclusa, 75,000 for 12 weeks. Remember, this is for genotypes two and three. Now, look at this. You think there's, if you're a conspiracy theorist, $900 for 12 weeks in India. And that's because they've, um, they've actually gone to generics there. So it can be done. Now, as you've been watching this slide, has a thought been entering your brain? Which one's that? <laughs> so back to my patient. So um, I thought he'd be in the audience. So um, this is back to my patient. This is his RNA. OK, so remember how hard? This is the guy that was hiding in the park benches. This is back in 2007 when I treated him. This is his RNA. It didn't have any effect. Second treatment, I brought him down to, to undetectable. But remember how sick he was that we had to stop treatment. So I, left, I, lo I lost track of him. And when he became 18, I transitioned him to uh, a group in New River Valley. I got an email this week from them. She sent me his chart, and this is his HC of the after, after he'd gotten treated. He's cured. It's awesome. It's awesome. And so this boy is now free of his hepatitis C. I mean, uh, you can make arguments that you know, he shouldn't have gotten that treatment or what have you. Um, you know, because of his disability or what have you, but he's cured and he hasn't he has end of treatment response. We haven't we don't know SVR yet on him. But SVRs are very high. Ninety 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 percentile, so chances are high. So we have three different viruses. They all behave differently. Uh, a is more acute, B and C more chronic. B contracted early in life will develop a chronic situation. Later in life you'll cure it. C is almost nearly always chronic. Adulthood of those who have been infected typically leads to um, uh, problems with cirrhosis and hepatitis cellular carcinoma. Two approaches that we've seen, vaccines or in hepatitis C treatment, uh, have been game changers in that. And so there might be in our era a time where only a few in, in this audience will be able to raise their hand and say that they've actually seen hepatitis or been involved with it. 
And any questions? Yes, sir. All right, lots of questions. Hold on, get away. So if the Zepatir and Harvoni cover the same stereotypes, but Zepatir is like half the cost, what are the instances in which you would choose Harvoni over Zepatir? So it just depends on like uh, insurance companies and um, those responses. Harvoni has, uh, Eplu, uh, Zepatir is, I think it's lower 90s compared to Harvoni, which is high 90s. So you might argue that you have a better response. There's a better track record um, with Harvoni so it's, um, it's pretty much what people are going to first um, these days. And jumping off that to that end, are insurances in Virginia covering these medications commonly, Virginia Premier and whatnot? Seeing as I've, this just became FDA approved two months ago, I haven't treated anybody yet. I have one patient actually who is 17 that um, had to get a gallbladder out first, and then we're going to talk about treatment. Um, and uh, probably going to start her on whatever one. Uh, is covered. Any other questions in the room? All right, we have a few minutes. I can unmute the phones. We've got a lot of people. I look, Dr. Safford isn't one of them, though. So. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, if you're on the line, the phones are unmuted, so if you would just mute your phones on your end if you do not have a question. That way we can't hear what's going on in your background. That would be whoever's talking on the phone right now, if you could mute your phone. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Cordell? No? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cordell. If you're on the line and want to ask a question, you can always email us at outreach at uh, Answer your questions. With that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone lines now. Thank you very much.